In some ways, Francis Ford Coppola made not just the last real Dracula, he made one of the last real horror movies, period, ending an era of cinema highlighted by such films as 1922's Nosferatu and Universal's 1931 Dracula. Coppola's Bram Stoker, however, is one of the best of its kind, and for me, the last Dracula that counts. And yet, this movie is as much about movies as it is monsters. But lest you worry, I will be getting to Gary Ullman's generation-defining performance. I'm only looking for the cinematograph. I understand it is a wonder of the civilized world. If you seek culture, then visit a museum. London is filled. Excuse me. So what do I mean when I say real movie? Well, this film was made in 1992, 30 years ago, using only practical effects, a decision that Coppola had to fight tooth and nail for, and he fired a whole team of effects artists who, along with the studio, kept trying to persuade him to use computer-generated visual effects to save time and resources. So he brought on the only person he could trust, his son, Roman Coppola, a budding magician and cinephile himself, to help him shoot Dracula all in camera. Given that the book Dracula was written around 1900, being the same date as the birth of the cinema, and not only that, but the birth of the cinema coming out of magicians and illusions and, and basically magic tricks, I thought that I would not only make the film uh, entirely in, in a false place, in a studio, but I would only use effects done as they would have been done in 1900. And don't forget, this was an exciting time for VFX and film, as they didn't know it yet, but we were on the precipice of a revolution that would forever change how movies were made, because literally, just a few months later, in 1993, Jurassic Park hit theaters across the world, turning the page on the films of old and the craftsmanship of practical effects artists. So now, what used to take the ingenuity of teams of creative problem solvers working days and nights, was now, for better or worse, solved by a computer with a click of a button. And what collaborative discoveries that used to be retrieved through hardships along the way have now been swept aside by a few lines of code. And what measure of a soul then within the story was now recalculated away for the fast and easy? Well, it's hard to tell. But let's examine one sequence in the very beginning so you can see what I'm talking about. Harker's train to Transylvania. The irony is that the process to explain how they shot the sequence requires computer-generated shots. So first, for the train to cast a shadow on the book, they needed to build a 20-foot wide book to force the perspective that the model train was indeed traveling in front of it, and the smoke billowing would also cast a shadow because, in fact, it was, hence an in-camera effect. Now, to show movement within the train, they actually had to build separate landscape scene layers from background to foreground, traveling at different speeds while the camera was also on a track moving in the opposite direction to create that sense of locomotion. And then it was a two-pass shot, meaning the film in the camera was wound back and moved to its first position. While from behind, Dracula's eyes was displayed on a rear projection screen while the stagecoach manually was moved up and down and then filmed again all together. An intense amount of work for 22 seconds. And that's just one scene, so extrapolate that process across the whole film. And it's fair to ask, was it worth it? Well, I think the overall effect is less grounded and therefore less realistically scary, as is and was the most common complaint, and I'd also say the most common misperception of the film, as it was chided in its day for being campy when everything else at the time, other than Buffy, was going for over-the-top realism. And this was purposely not that. This was surrealism, expressionism, a phantasmagora, and an homage to the magicianship of the cinematograph from the Lumiere brothers to Hollywood's horror roots with MGM's creature features and Universal's monster movies, but was also in reverence of Orson Welles as Dracula was evocative of Citizen Kane as it was Chad Browning's Count Dracul. This film also came out in a time where I was obsessed with vampires and of course, read Bram Stoker's Dracula as well as anything I could get my hands on from Anne Rice. The film Interview with a Vampire came out only two years later, 
But in 1992, again, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was on TV, and at the time, pop culture was having a vampire moment that wouldn't regain its footing until the Twilight Saga some 15 years later. Yet in many ways, this vampiric blip of the early 90s was also a continuation of solid 80s horrors with the likes of some of my favorites, The Lost Boys and The Monster Squad. Yet with other than Anne Rice's interpretation of the vampire mythos, everybody seemed to be torquing up the teenage sensibilities, attempting to make the genre more hip and more grunge if you will. But this is something Coppola did not want to do, save for two glaring exceptions which I will touch base on in a moment. But I think he wanted to make a horror film from his childhood that was referential in tone and style, but in execution and design, specifically costume design, was wholly original. And I could write a lengthy dissertation on the artist and costume designs of the Oscar winning Aiko Ishioka, as she is the genius behind the avant-garde. Her costumes created novelty in a world of mimics, especially within the archetypal Count Dracula aesthetic. She turned it on its head repeatedly with not just one redesign, but multiple groundbreaking character reinterpretations. The paradox of putting a never before seen Dracula within a film so classically referential is what I think made her design stand out so remarkably, and yet could have easily overshadowed the actor within the costume, but they did not, not Gary Oldman. Now Michael Keaton, who was also in talks to play the Count, is my Batman, and Gary Oldman is my Bat. Man, sorry Christopher Lee and Mr. Lugosi. Of course Ico's costumes helped and Coppola's grand concept birthed this revision. It was Gary Ullman's performance across varying incarnations and ages of Dracula is what truly set this film apart from every other vampire movie that preceded it and that followed it. And at the time he was one of the least well-known actors in the film and not Coppola's first choice. but. He's the reason I believe that this movie is so memorable, because all the effort to create an authentic, surrealist homage to classic cinema would be for naught had the actor playing Dracula been literally, I believe, anybody else, because the campiness of the movie sort of melts away as soon as he hits the screen. And it's worth being said that had Jonathan Harker's character been played by anybody else, like as it was originally intended for Johnny Depp to play, had the studio agreed with his star potential at the time, the film probably would have been received better and been better. And yet this was the studio trying to placate the teenage demo, and which was done well with Winona who is fantastic. However, she is in fact can be credited for this film existing at all, as she is the one who brought Francis the screenplay, and she was the one trying to push for her then boyfriend Johnny Depp to play the part. Now I love Keanu and can overlook his performances almost in the same way that I can in The Matrix because you also had Sir Anthony Hopkins, Tom Waits, and Sadie Frost performances along with Ullman that for me overshadowed Keanu's. Yet I sincerely think if anybody else donned the cape in Widow's Peak, I think the whole film, all the labor and technical prowess would have been a waste had it not been anchored by his performance, a performance I can't even imagine being topped making him for me the best Dracula without equal. With Oldman, Coppola found an actor capable of breathing new life into Bram Stoker's character as he clearly did not feel fully bound to the literary source material. Yet he also did not take frivolous creative liberties simply for stylistic reasons, as he was also directly making a commentary on the soul of cinema and the tendency of modern studios to suck the marrow of meaning and the magic from movie making of old. And this was still right before big budget CGI tentpoles would completely devour how films were shot from this point on. But is this just the nature of progress? As the demonic folklore of old was cast aside by the Victorian allegory of the vampire, and the romanticism of Shelley's Frankenstein and Bram's Dracula now contorted by the eroticism of modernity and barely fending off the zealotry of the technocrats. So as history marches forward, is it time that really betrays us? Or is it bottom lines? Or is it the nature of science and technology? As a camera also attempts to capture the essence of life and the vitality of a scene, so as to extract time from time, is it too then not preying on the present moment, stealing it from a mortal and fleeting existence? Who's the real victim within this metaphor? So is it then just easier to point the finger at the blood-sucking Hollywood execs as they try to siphon capital from art or expedience from labored craftsmen as they ensnarl and harness the light from fresh-faced talent that flood into LA each year so as to keep their own power 
and youth within the movie making machine. This is now a modern day trope, the pitfalls of the virgin artist laid bare at the altar of industry. And in many ways, Coppola's Dracula is an act of biting back on that. But dare I say it, while the film has left a mark on the genre, the studios have driven a stake into the heart of classic horrors and the movies of old. Now, I am in no way preaching against progress as I have a digital cinema camera right here, but just to pose the idea that sometimes what you profit from in the margins, you may lose in value and in quality of results. And sometimes, and maybe not often, harder is better. And without toil, without a little blood, sweat, and tears lost, what have you gained? For me, Coppola's relentless vision and puritanical devotion to the medium, as well as Oldman's undying dedication to play the count, produced not just the finest works of pure horror cinema, but the most enduring Dracula to grace the silver screen. And it may as well just be the last. <laughs> it's too precious a thing in these times. Victories of my great race are but a tale to be told.